Good morning, everyone. Let me start with a, a, an introduction of Professor Ali Mehrizi Sani, um, who received the PhD degree from the University of Toronto in uh, 2011. Uh, he's currently an associate professor at Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, Virginia. His area of interest include power system applications of power electronics and integration of renewable energy resources. He's an editor of IEEE Transactions on Power Systems, IEEE Transactions on Energy Conversion, and IEEE Power Engineering Letters. He's, he was also an editor of IEEE Transaction on Power Delivery and Wiley International Transactions. So off to you, Ali. Uh, I believe we've got around 40 minutes or so uh, for the presentation. And after that, uh, we will have 15 minutes uh, to 20 minutes of Q&A. All right. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Beirut. And uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this, uh, this webinar. Um, so um, what I'm going to be talking about is essentially ideas for control of low inertia microgrids with inverted based resources. Of course, this work is based on what my students have done over the years. Uh, some results are also based on what we have done with our collaborators in other labs and other universities. And you will see a list of those at the end of these slides on their, uh, on their publications. Um, you see actually a, a picture of some of the students who have contributed to this work over the years. And of course the work is uh, uh, supported by the US National Science Foundation. Um, so just uh, so everybody knows where Virginia Tech is, this is where Virginia is, state of Virginia is in the, in the United States. Virginia Tech is actually exactly where this pin is. Um, in case you are wondering, uh, Virginia did vote for uh, Vice President Joe Biden, former Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, we have a beautiful campus uh, with lots of impressive buildings. Um, this one is actually one of your buildings, uh, but uh, we also have uh, um, nicer, older style uh, buildings that are kind of uh, styled after Cambridge and, and Oxford. So uh, since I'll be discussing our work in terms of microgrid operation, so let's define what a microgrid is. Um, and this definition is based on the US Department of Energy's definition. Um, this is uh, in the definition we were converging on back in 2000 and uh, around 2008, uh, nine timeframe. So a microgrid is a complete but miniature power system that is an aggregate of co-located resources and those resources can be loads, uh, generation units and storage units, uh, which we'll collectively call DRs or distributed energy resources. And they're interfaced to the grid at the distribution level uh, through a point of common coupling. So additionally, microgrid was, was kind of um, uh, considered to have one PCC point of common coupling, but now the concept is being extended and we are, we are talking about multiple points of couple, uh, common coupling as well. And then the microgrid, and this is crucial, can operate in both grid connected mode and islanded modes. Essentially, um, when high quality power is not available from the grid, microgrid islands and it, uh, maintains power to the critical loads until power from the grid becomes available again and the microgrid can reconnect to, uh, to the grid. Of course, microgrid have lots of applications, most of which are quite niche applications. For example, um, applications for uh, getting power to remote or enabling electricity for remote areas. Uh, it's, it's a big thing in Northern areas of Canada, uh, these areas uh, which are practically very, very close to the, to the North Pole. It will be very expensive uh, to have power lines drawn all the way from the uh, from Southern part of Canada uh, from the generation centers uh, to these areas. And uh, the cost of electricity would be very, very high. Actually, even if, um, some um, solution, the, the cost of electricity is quite high there um, on the order of two to $3 per kilowatt hour and, and compare that with uh, uh, eight to 10 cents per kilowatt hours in bigger cities. So several order, orders of magnitude, um, larger cost of electricity in those areas. Uh, that's why uh, they are a very good candidate for microgrids. In fact, many communities actually already do have uh, microgrids implemented, uh, implemented in those areas. 
Uh, military camps, similar kind of a type of application. They are remote and they are movable. So microgrids can be a very good solution for them. And again, they are, um, US Department of Defense has several of their sites um, operated as microgrids. Uh, resiliency, resiliency is a big thing, uh, essentially to help with the sensitive loads, making sure that the uh, buildings, campus, those uh, critical loads get the power they need even in case of larger scale disturbances to the power system. And uh, DC loads, essentially with operating a, a microgrid, now in this case a DC microgrid, we can save on the losses because of the DC to AC conversion process. So. Uh, Concept, um, I just started probably about uh, two decades ago and it's going to stay with us uh, for foreseeable futures. And uh, here's an example of a microgrid. Uh, this is uh, the former Navy yard in Philadelphia that has been converted to a commercial industrial zone. Um, this is kind of a uh, high level diagram of how uh, this actually looks like. There are connections to the, to the main grid. Uh, we work on this on a project that was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy with uh, with Alstom Grid, PNNL. PNNL is one of the national labs in the U.S., uh, University of California, Berkeley, and City of Philadelphia, and a few more. The idea was to enable operation of this uh, uh, this Navy Yard as a micro grid to ensure availability of electric power in case uh, the grid is out. There are a number of bakeries, uh, 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 closing stores, uh, storage, communication, and so on. So they needed the um, kind of a higher um, uh, the standard of power delivery. Um, so related to microgrid at the same time, they're also looking at the operation of power systems with a large share of inverters. Uh, this is a map of the United States. Uh, it shows the renewable portfolio standards for different states. Uh, this is uh, the most up-to-date map from September 2020, just two months ago. It shows that, that um, several states, some of them actually have quite an aggressive renewable uh, kind of uh, the, the, the goals. For example, California is looking at 60% renewables by 2030. Um, and then they also are uh, talking about 100% uh, by 2045. My state, Virginia, is looking at 100% by 2045. In fact, the Virginia Tech campus has a clean energy initiative to also enable that for, uh, I think the time when we're looking at there is 2030, uh, a bit more aggressive than what the, what the state is looking at. Um, uh, most states in the in the United States actually do consider hydropower to be part of renewable portfolio. So if these numbers look very high, uh, it's because part of part of it is um, already hydro. It's not that it's going to be 100% uh, inverter based generation. But of course, with the exception of hydro, most other renewables, especially PV and uh, Type Three and Four wind generation, they do utilize inverters to in, in, um, <clears throat> interface to the grid to convert DC from PV to AC, or in case of wind, to condition the AC by formless generated um, so that it's something of high quality for uh, the power system. So we know more or less how to operate a grid with some inverters, but the question is how we can uh, operate a grid with this very high percentage of inverters, um, in which case many of our traditional concepts are challenged. Um, this also shows the electricity generation trend in the US. Most notable is coal. Um, back in 2007, eight timeframe, coal had about 70% uh, of the share of electricity generation. Now it's down to 20%. This is the, the, the black trace. Renewables have been on the rise for the last two decades. And um, uh, and the natural gas. Natural gas has also been increasing. It's a fossil fuel based, of course, but it's not that unclean. So it's uh, um, the, the, the goals to get uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, that, that type of generation lower are not as aggressive as the goals for, for coal power. So we are moving toward a renewable based um, electricity generation. Um, and um, with this shift, of course, comes variability, comes more distributed generation, 
we would have more different protection concepts, uh, different power flow patterns, and so on. Essentially, our generation and load mix, both of them are changing. What this figure shows is um, essentially the BPA service area. BPA is Bonneville Power Administration. It's a transmission service company servicing Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and a bit of Montana in the Northwest um, corner of the, of the United States. So the BPA service area has several times experienced 100% wind generation. This typically happens um, in fall because there's um, the, the rivers, the, the, the water in the rivers is not as, uh, th th as much. And then there are also, probably more importantly, there are lots of fish restrictions. So hydro generation goes down and, um, and then that gives more chance to wind generation to increase. The ERCOT system in Texas has also had instances of 50% instantaneous, power, instantaneous uh, power from wind. So we are losing inertia and physical link between power and frequency. And at the same time, we are also seeing similar uh, changes on the load side. Um, the biggest loads that we have in the power system are uh, motors. Uh, but most of motors are now actually interfaced to the grid through drives. They have inverters. Uh, so that is also kind of uh, changing, increasing the share of inverters uh, as well. Uh, lights are becoming more inverter-based. Modern appliances also have intrinsic inverters inside as well. So essentially, the power system needs to accommodate inverters and renewables without significant changes to, to the system itself. And uh, uh, we are also seeing uh, changes in the relevant standards, IEEE standard 1547. Um, in the first iteration, uh, the standard required that in response to disturbances, DRs needed to uh, disconnect. This is 2003, we didn't know much about, or we didn't have much experience with the, with the DRs. So um, the idea was that, um, well, DRs, we don't really know what, what you, how you work, so please just disconnect. Um, um, in, in a, in a, when you're in trouble, we just don't want you to complicate that trouble uh, much more. And this was also the low penetration time. Uh, as uh, we had more penetration of inverters, more penetration of renewables, then uh, uh, the, the ideas of the standard changed. So it actually took the community 12 years to feel the need to come up with an updated version of the standard. In 2015, the standard was updated and uh, then it actually requires the Rs to write through the disturbances. Again, essentially the thought is, hey, please don't disconnect. I still need your generation, but do not do much else because again, we don't really believe in the capabilities that you have. And then only three years after that, 2018, uh, the, uh, the standard was updated again to uh, kind of at this time actually require DRs to help in case of disturbances. So, this is somehow what the new power system terminology sometimes refers to as grid forming capabilities. Uh, previous generation would call them smart inverters. Essentially, uh, we want them to have certain features, having voltage write through capability, frequency write through capability, voltage support, and, uh, and so on. And here's a very, um, kind of just a demonstration of what the Rs may be able to do. I borrowed this from a, um, from actually the documents related to the, the standard itself um, and by the authors of the standard. So this is uh, an example of a grid response to disturbance with that and with uh, such capabilities. You can see in a certain disturbance, if the DR helps, in this case, that would be the green trace uh, and helping actually means by injecting reactive power then the grid recovers faster. I get this response as opposed to this one. And also my voltage profile is not going to suffer that much. My uh, voltage drops only to um, maybe 90, 93 uh, per unit as opposed to going all the way down to 80 per unit, uh, 0.8 per unit. So um, let me skip these two. And then, so with that introduction, uh, we are going to specifically look at the problem of control of uh, gray boxed and variable inverter systems. I say gray boxed instead of black boxed because typically we know some stuff about those inverters. It's not that we are totally in the dark. So 
For inverters, the specific challenges that we are going to be looking at is that um, first, we don't have full models of those inverters. Uh, manufacturers sometimes share uh, simplified models, uh, but we don't have the full-fledged um, details on those models. Of course, you want to control something. The first thing is to know what it is that you are controlling so that uh, we challenge our work. Um, inverters are more sensitive to essentially over voltages and over currents because of um, the power electronic switches they have. Uh, so they are more sensitive to abnormal operations in the grid as well. And also, uh, we, we have limited access to the internal parameters of the controllers. Um, sometimes you can, con you can change, say, gains, but you cannot really change the type of control that is implemented. So we have limited control, uh, limited access to those, uh, uh, those structures. And of course, at the same time, these inverters are used in settings such as microgrids or renewables that we just talked about. And those are essentially challenging as well, because for example, in a microgrid setting, uh, of course, microgrid is a, is a small by definition. So uh, it can change more frequently. And those changes would have a large impact on the system, just because again, um, say a load disconnects that might easily be say 10% of the load on the microgrid because we just don't have too many loads. Or similarly for a generation, the generation output changes. So that might um, kind of uh, change the, uh, the system you're looking at, uh, the features of that system that you're looking at. And that would require you to redesign the controllers to make sure that the controllers are still performing well. Uh, which actually uh, takes me to my second point, that is um, when we design controllers, we design them for a pre-specified configuration, uh, but then the performance of the controllers deteriorate when the host system itself changes. So the question is what we can do uh, for control of these devices that, well, devices themselves, have, there are certain challenges for their control and the settings that the devices are being used uh, also uh, poses some challenges for us. Uh, here's an example of what I'm really talking about. So uh, here on the top, you see uh, there's a certain well, the original system. Uh, in response to a certain step change, uh, I get some dynamics, I get some disturbances. In this case, my response has some reasonable overshoot, 15%, some reasonable settling time, um, 32 milliseconds. So it, it's fine. Uh, but same system, same disturbance, when one of the loads disconnects, this is the microgrid scenario that I just mentioned. Uh, now the same disturbance now gives me 26% overshoot, much higher than what I had over here. And my settling time is now double what I had before, 67. So this is much longer um, than what I had before. So 67 milliseconds compared to 32 milliseconds. So same system, same disturbance, um, very different responses. Um, and these type of scenarios require solutions that are as agnostic as possible to that system that's being controlled. Because um, again, that system, the whole system keeps changing. So we don't want to really have to redesign our controllers. And the question is, how can we make sure our inverter units are tightly controlled and do not violate their limits even when the host grid or microgrid changes significantly. That is what we are trying to answer in this in this talk. Look at some of the ideas we have had. Um, and I put this um, inverter in gray because the solution, uh, while motivated by inverter-dominated microgrids, is not really restricted to only inverter systems. Um, essentially, any dynamic system can benefit, or some ideas here can also be implemented for those systems too. So, of course, um, there are many, many uh, other researchers who have worked on the idea of control of systems with limited uh, knowledge, with limited visibility about them. Uh, uh, very broadly, the existing, existing uh, approaches uh, can be categorized as either analytical formulation and model-based tuning and optimization-based work. So in the first category, when we have this analytical uh, formulation, really what we do is we design, we devise a uh, mathematical model of a system, 
Um, we, if needed, we simplify that, but most of the time it's going to be that needed to simplify it. And then using linear, sometimes nonlinear control methods, uh, we kind of um, come up with appropriate control structure, appropriate control parameters. Second large category, optimization-based design. In this case, um, we develop a model of the system in a transient simulation for program, uh, for example, PSCAD MTDC that actually has components for this type of design. And then we perform multiple runs to minimize a certain cost function that captures the performance, the dynamic performance of the system. And then uh, using that, we uh, find the optimal values for the controllers. Uh, the table here shows kind of a rundown of several of these approaches. I'm not going to uh, spend time on those, uh, but uh, uh, but of course, as I said there's a, there's a very rich literature on control. Um, so, why do we need another control method? Essentially, because um, uh, these methods generally the, the the problem with these approaches is that uh, they have limited robustness with respect to topology, operating point, and system parameters. So, uh, system changes. They, uh, the performance is not going to be as good of performance as we had hoped for. And if uh, this is probably the bigger challenge and that is if retuning is needed, uh, it would be difficult because you probably have to go back to the field and adjust the parameters of those, uh, uh, those devices, those inverters that you, that you have. And then um, if they are based on the models, as you said, um, those models are not always, always available. So let's see what they can do. Um, so as I said, there's been lots of interesting work on control design, and we are going to look at an alternate idea. So instead of updating the control structure and its parameters, which we may not really have access to, um, um, what we do is we try to achieve a better response by temporarily manipulating the set point itself. We manipulate the set point because uh, that's the easiest thing we can change. Changing the set point is much easier than changing your parameters uh, or the control structure. So it's a natural choice to, um, to, um, to, try to try to adjust. I will get back to this in a minute on how we actually are going to do this, but the features that we are looking for are essentially we want our method to be robust to the topological changes in the system. We want it to be independent or as independent as possible of the system model. And of course, we wanted to have uh, to require little information about the, the unit it's controlling. Um, these are, of course, big promises. So let's see how we can, we can do this. As I said, we don't want to change our original controllers. We want them to keep them, uh, we want to keep them in place, but we are going to augment them with some add-on feature. And the basic of how this works is, is shown here. So let's look at this. Um, assume the set point for x of t is changed from some x1 to x2. And x can be any quantity, anything you want to control, voltage, current, power, even um, uh, speed, uh, torque, uh, whatever. Um, so the, the figure here shows the response. So my set point, the yellow trace, disregard this part for now. The yellow trace changes from x1 to x2. And um, as a result of this change in the set point, what happens is I'm going to get some response. It's a dynamical system. Uh, and I get this blue trace in this particular case. Uh, I have a large overshoot here, a long settling time. And these are things I don't like, right? I'm, I want my system to have a smaller overshoot and I, I also want it to settle much faster. So what we are going to do is actually what's shown here. We are going to manipulate the, response, the, the set point. We are going to actually, instead of keeping the set point constant at x2, I'm going to move it around. I'm going to bring it down to this other value. Now, my, my dynamical system inverter essentially uh, now tries to track this new set point. And because of that, it's going to slow down instead of going all the way up. Now it's going to slow down. If I do this, uh, if I get the timing right, then I would get this response, the, the black trace here. Actually, the black trace that you're seeing here is exactly the response of this particular system uh, to, uh, to this type of uh, set point change. So, and uh, I would pick the black response any day over the blue one. Uh, it is, uh, the overshoot is very small, 
the settling time is much smaller compared to the original response of the system as well. So this is really the essence of the idea. It's very simple, yet it's, uh, it proves to be very effective in improving the dynamics of the, um, of the system. And we like simple. Uh, just recall that uh, there are tons of ideas on uh, better controllers, better primary controllers for power systems. And still we, uh, probably 90% of the uh, controllers in power system are actually PI based just because PI controllers are very, very simple. So same thing here. The idea is very simple. We can actually um, use them to further improve even the PI controllers. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So um, this diagram here shows the standard control method. You have some unit, you have a primary controller and a set point that comes from some higher level control. The, the primary controller would look at the set point and the response and uh, issues command to the, uh, to the unit. So what we are proposing here is really this set point modulation block that uh, gets this set point and then based on the response of the system, based, based on its trend, based on its uh, violations of the limits and so on, uh, comes up with this modulated set point, which is then fed into the primary controller. Um, so really the idea is that we are closing a loop around the original loop of the system, uh, the original loop that the system already had. So let's uh, um, look, see how this can be done. So um, we have shown that for certain systems, uh, the best strategy we can apply for the timing of those set point changes is to apply a temporary change of set point, something like here, uh, uh, that starts at time, let's call this T1, and ends at another time, let's call this T2. And then we, we have shown that the best kind of choice of T1 and T2 would be so that we choose T1 so that the peak of the response equals the reference. So I choose T1, this value, so that this peak actually becomes equal to this value. So in this case, my actual T1 had to be a smaller value. <clears throat> and then um, T2, we choose T2 to be the time uh, of the peak. So the time that this response uh, hits the peak. So, uh, in this figure, now you see the original response of a certain system. In this case, this is actually a second order um, function. It was easier to do it in, uh, for demonstration purposes. Uh, so, um, so I have, again, large overshoot, long settling time. This is the response when I choose T1 as I just described, but T2 is not exactly time of peak as uh, here. Uh, the response is a bit better, at least my overshoot is not as big, but it's not exactly what I was hoping for. So let's see what we can do. If I decrease T2, if I, it becomes closer to time of peak, you see if I go back, uh, this value, uh, now it's closer to time of peak, my response becomes better. I have a smaller overshoot. And then if I, uh, decrease uh, T2 further, make it closer to T peak. I get a better response and better and better as I continue. And then when T2 um, is exactly time of the peak, then I get this response essentially, literally no overshoot and, um, and I get this kind of flat type of response. Um, very beautiful. Uh, one issue is that of course, this control approach is not going to be implementable by exp having to explicitly calculate T1 and T2. Why? Of course, um, if I need to calculate something, I need to have the model. And we just started with the premise that we cannot really expect to have the model or the system parameters. So you either have to have closed form solution or a faster than real time simulator. Either way, again, you need to have the, the model. Um, but uh, don't get too disappointed yet. Uh, we can, um, while this method is not really implementable by explicitly calculating T1 and T2, uh, there is a way to implement it. I wanted to show this T2, T1, T2 kind of um, uh, notion because it shows that this method is actually viable. We are not really chasing wild goose. So there is, uh, there is a solution. It's for us to actually find that without necessarily having to calculate T1 and T2, that where and how we can time the 
uh, the, uh, the changes in the, in the set point. So um, I'm going to talk about that solution in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, so of course, first uh, we chose the name space for this approach, set point automatic adjustment with correction enabled, which suggests that there was actually an earlier version of this. We did not have correction. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm going to be referring to this method as a space. Um, and we implemented this uh, based on the finite state machine. This is actually a simplified version of that final state machine that really puts the system into a uh, number of states depending on the violations of the limits, uh, the, the depending on the variations of the response, uh, the set point itself, and so on. Um, I'm not really going to go through the details of this state machine for two reasons. One of them is, of course, it can get really complicated. And then the other one is we, um, we have, devised quite recently in the last few years, an even better way of implementing space. So now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show some early results and then we can uh, discuss the, the other methods that we have had. So of course, yeah, the salient features uh, of this strategy is it's based on local signals. I do not need um, the communication or any fancy thing. Um, it's independent or as independent as possible from the system model and is robust to the changes in the parameters of the system. So <clears throat> um, as I said, I'm going to share some of the case studies we have performed. Uh, the first case study is based on the i 34 bus system. We added three DJ units and, and, a, uh, and a load. And this is now operating in the grid connected mode. The top uh, diagram that you see over here is the response of the system to a set point change or response of DG2 to a, to a set point change. And you see without the space, I have 40% overshoot. Uh, in the second case here, I figure B, uh, space is activated and essentially my overshoot is significantly smaller than what I had here. Uh, it's a beautiful response, essentially uh, eliminating that overshoot, which could, be quite a bit of a problem, especially if this DG is already operating close to its limits. Another case, uh, this is when the disturbance is not caused by a set point change, uh, it's caused by essentially a load disconnection scenario. So this um, resistor is disconnected, this load is uh, disconnected. Um, uh, it's a relatively larger half a pair unit load. And then again, we're looking at the response of the system. Without the space, I have this much overshoot in my uh, current uh, response, 15%. And with the space, then essentially that kind of uh, disturbance, that, uh, that transient is mitigated. Uh, and then in another case, we are looking at the robustness of space in um, the respect to system imbalance. So this is now the IEEE 13 bus system. It's an unbalanced system. Uh, and we added a DG unit, a, a test load, and we disconnected this from the grid. So now this is operating in the islanded mode. Um, so uh, when the, we switch off the load, and then we are looking at the system response. Again, the black trace shows the system response without the space. So we, you see we have a fairly sustained oscillatory behavior here. When the space is active through um, applying changes in those modulated uh, change, uh, changes in the set point, it has been able to essentially uh, get us a, a, the system response that settles uh, in, in about one, one second. So, Significantly good um, improvement because uh, it turns an oscillatory response into, into a stable response. So uh, let's take this idea uh, one step further now that we have some confidence that our simple method would work. Let's see how we can make it better. Uh, of course, you're engineers, we are always looking at, uh, at improvements. So there are, um, it turns out that this method may get a stock in a state, in a certain state of the state machine, if the modification in the set point do not improve the response. Now, in the results that I showed before, that didn't happen. And then, actually, our machine, our, our final state machine, had a provision that if it, if the if there was this case of getting a stock, uh, then it would just release the set point, and then I would go back to the uh, kind of unmodified 
uh, behavior, kind of a set point behavior of the system. But that's a still a possibility. Um, so we're looking at other methods to implement our, uh, our controller. And then the other thing is space in its current form is not directly applicable to applications such as drive systems because they do not really like to see harsh step changes in the set point. Typically, uh, even if you do not have space, uh, typically behind the PI controller, there is a low pass filter uh, that um, kind of um, makes sure that you do not apply set point changes in the step rather by essentially a, a ramp and so on. So uh, what do we do? So uh, the first idea is, uh, of course, we want to, want to make sure that the set point changes are smooth, hence the name is smooth space. Uh, so instead of applying a set point change in a form of a step, we make it pro uh, proportional to the predicted error. So you see here, um, if my response, um, uh, this error, let me actually define the error. The error is the error between the, is the tracking error. So this is the difference between the, uh, the, the measurement and the, uh, the, the set point. So if that error is large, then I would modify the set point and uh, uh, based on kind of the value of the predicted error. And that predicted error in this case is obtained based on a uh, leaf lag compensator. So, um, so my change in the set point in this case are not going to be a uh, step. So here's a kind of a, a diagram showing that. So this, the uh, the dashed line shows the changes when they're applied as a step with original space. And then um, this one is the response. The, the red one is the, is the modified set points that I have with, uh, with the SS space. So, uh, so that's one, one improvement. And then the other thing is, it turns out that we can actually just go ahead and, and remove the conditional statement altogether. So instead of applying, modifying the setpoint only when the error is large, we can go ahead and do it all essentially regardless. Because uh, um, if, even if the error is uh, small, we can still improve the response by kind of preemptively changing the, uh, the, the set point. And then prediction can also be done using a simple linear predictor instead of uh, having uh, this um, new lag prediction. So let's look at some of the uh, case studies we have performed using uh, this method. Uh, this one is based on a drive system at Technical University of Graz in Austria. Uh, this is an inverter based kind of application uh, here I have the DC motor. The DC motor, we are controlling the DC motor. Uh, the induction machine is essentially our load. The controller is implemented in DS space um, and then um, using Simlink. And then um, it's uh, downloaded to, to DS space for the, um, for the evaluation. So here we're looking at the, at the step change in the speed set point. My speed changes from 500 RPM to 600 RPM. Uh, I'm showing both simulation results and experimental results, but I'm really going to focus on experiments because actually, if you look very closely, um, both simulation results and experimental results are quite, quite similar. Here, we're looking at four cases. The first case is just the base case uh, when I have just the PI, the original controller in the system. I think in this case, it did happen to be a PI controller. Uh, second case is the filter solution that I mentioned. Essentially, uh, we pass the set point through a low pass filter before we get it to the drive system. Case C is conventional standard space. And case D is the smooth space that we uh, just introduced. So as I said, we apply a set point change from 500 RPM to 600 RPM. And uh, the black trace shows the adjusted, the modified, the mod modulated set point, and the red trace shows the actual set point. Uh, sorry, the actual response of the system. Um, so uh, with pre-filter, the response is of course better in terms of overshoot uh, than what we had with the origin compared to the original system, uh, but we still have a bit of oscillations on overshoot. The space uh, is better, it's faster, but remember we said we didn't like space in this particular application because uh, drives do not take the, or motors do not take the um, uh, step changes very well. And then uh, we look at a uh, smoother space, which see that, which you can see that it has really, really good results. Essentially, um, I do not have any, any big, uh, big overshoot and it's also fast. In this case, um, 
Um, let's actually look at the numbers I have on this slide. So this is previous slide, previous kind of uh, diagrams, but superimposed on the same um, uh, on the same diagram, so it makes the comparison easier. Um, um, so the overshoot in case of S space, which would be the black trace here, uh, this one, uh, the overshoot is only 4%. You see there is only a slight deviation over here. That is an order of magnitude smaller than the original response of the system with the uh, just the base case. Uh, so that's good, that's, that's encouraging. At the same time, my settling time is much shorter. I have only 42 milliseconds of settling time compared to 140. That's uh, uh, one third of what I get with the original system here. Um, and um, uh, so space does, uh, does a little bit better, 30% uh, uh, compared to the base case. But this application, as a space, is uh, the behavior is certainly um, significantly more improved compared to the base case. So uh, let's look at another scenario. Here, uh, I apply a sudden load change to compare the robustness of these different control methods uh, to an uh, external disturbance. Of course, as a result of this, this, this load change, uh, the motor speed is going to go through some transients, and we are going to compare those transients uh, here. So original system and the um, and pre-filter, they have the same response. Pre-filter only uh, pre-filters your set point. In this case, set point hasn't changed. So it's natural that this and this, these two responses are identical. And then I have uh, uh, space and S space. Um, so you see that the, uh, the original space is a bit better, but SS space is significantly better with a deviation of a speed of only 12 RPM uh, from 500 set point. So 12 RPM uh, delta here compared to 48. So again, a four fold um, improvement in the uh, behavior of the, uh, of the overshoot of the, of the system. Uh, and then uh, uh, sensitivity to system parameters. Um, here, what uh, we are changing is J, the moment of inertia of the system. It's really changed from its design value. So uh, whoever designed the controller assumed a certain J, went ahead and, and designed the parameters of the controller. And now we are going to change that. Of course, we do it in simulation because it's much easier to do it in simulation than in the, the experiments. So we change it uh, once to one third of its original value and then to three times its original value. Again, we are going to apply a change in the speed and see how our system behaves. Um, so the base case here for one third of the uh, J value uh, has 50% overshoot and a settling time of 80 milliseconds. Uh, with the SS space, my overshoot is practically zero, and my settling time is also faster, uh, 50 milliseconds compared to 80. Um, this is actually some really encouraging results. Remember, we talked about losing inertia and having low inertia grids. So in this case, actually, we have we have uh, the the inertia of the that motor system has decreased. Uh, well, we don't really see an impact on the primary control's behavior uh, because of space. Uh, of course, there is more to power system than just the primary controls, but we at least know that our initial line of defense, the primary control is strong in this case. And then on the right side, uh, you see the results when the moment of inertia is increased to three times the original value. Again, with S space, um, I have a faster response, 10% overshoot compared to 40% original, and the settling time is half of what I have with the original system. Let me show you one uh, more case study, and then uh, um, uh, we'll stop for questions. So this case study is actually a micro, uh, an inverter-based microgrid. This is a, uh, a physical test bed. Uh, at the University of Strathclyde, which we collaborated on in this project uh, for this uh, essentially set of uh, uh, improvements. And then um, the, the microgrid includes synchronous generators, includes uh, lots of inverter-based loads and inverter-based generation. And let's look at the scenarios. This is actually a very efficient slide. We are looking here at um, seven scenarios. Um, changes in the real power set point, changes, positive and negative changes, or step up and down in the voltage, 
uh, changes in the virtual impedance, uh, another change in the real power, and uh, in, in uh, energization of an induction model. Uh, for different events, we are comparing the, um, the, the tracking error, essentially the different or the integral of the difference between set point and the response of the system uh, uh, for these different scenarios. Here, you're, you're, you're looking at um, essentially the inherent response, which is blue, and also response with different types of predictions, linear, ex exponential, quadratic. I didn't speak uh, too much about these different types of predictions. Uh, most of the time, as I said, we do stick with the linear. It's simple and its performance is actually quite good. In fact, you are here you're seeing that um, uh, the linear, the red bars have better performance than all the other bars, the blue bars, which is the original, and the um, uh, orange and green bars. So let's look at this. Uh, these two other ones are the response for exponential and quadratic ex uh, um, prediction. This one is for linear. And um, here we're looking at those seven scenarios. The blue trace shows the original response. The red trace shows the response with the space. And we see that in virtually every single one of these uh, seven scenarios, the dynamic that I get with the space with the red trace is significantly better than what I get uh, with the original original system. Um, in the interest of time, I think I will stop here. Um, and of course, if there are questions, let me just talk about this, that why does uh, uh, space work so beautifully? The idea is really what we are doing here is um, we are adding a second control loop around the original control loop of the, the system. So this we saw this before. Uh, um, essentially, while we don't have access to the original control loop, well, we can still improve or change its performance using this external uh, kind of loop. We are, what we are really doing is we are doing some form of uh, uh, loop shaping. In case of S space, effectively what we are doing is we are adding a predictive term to our control system. What does that mean? It means if I use a linear predictor and if the original control, this primary control is a PI, we can go ahead, write equations and, the, and see that the, effectively what we are having is we are converting that PI controller uh, to a PID. Of course, without really having to change this primary controller. Um, so this addresses our requirement to improve the uh, controller in a gray box system without accessing its uh, uh, control structure. And if even if there is no predictor, SS space still boots, boosts uh, the p term, uh, the proportional term, which improve the improves the speed of the response of the system. So um, these results, uh, we can talk about these uh, theoretical results uh, offline or if, it, uh, if they come up during the question session. Uh, but they really talk about um, essentially higher order kind of uh, performance criteria for, for this space. Uh, these are a number of papers that are developed uh, based on this work uh, with students, with our collaborators at different universities. And uh, I would uh, I will stop here and welcome any questions you may have uh, based on this work. Okay, thank you so much, Ali, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I believe we've got uh, quite some time, about 10 minutes for questions. And I think we already have one question in the Q&A session. Uh, how do you calculate the second set point AX2 at time T1? I don't know exactly which slide it corresponds to, but I... Uh, okay, uh, I think I know which slide that is, but um, actually I can just show this. Um, let me see if I can scroll through the slides. Okay. Uh, the short answer is, okay. The short answer is, um, and unless we have a very simple system, unless we have a second order system, which of course never happens, uh, at least in our system, uh, then we actually do not calculate that T1. If you have a second order system, we have a closed form 
um, kind of for T1. But we, don't, we, we do not really have that uh, kind of a, um, simple system. So that's why we had this implementation based on the, um, I think it was the next slide that we had this implementation based on the final state machine, which we further improved to what we call the SS space method, which actually does not even need you to uh, kind of do the, uh, where is this? Yeah, uh, do the calculations. You, uh, you change your set point as shown here, you change your set point uh, as a factor of the, um, the, the, uh, the tracking error. Now, this M is in fact a control parameter, kind of a parameter of this uh, system. Um, there is kind of a, there's a discussion, actually one of the slides that I skipped, there's a discussion that how I would need to choose that value. Um, let me go there. Uh, in most practical cases though, we, and actually in the case studies that I showed here, uh, the value of, uh, M is simply 0.2. Uh, it happens that 0.2 uh, kind of has been kind of a compromise and um, kind of uh, affecting a large enough change in the set in, in the in the set point at the same time not um, creating too much disturbance in the system itself. Um, um, and then of course, if you're looking at the mathematical proof, there is uh, we, we can discuss that. That's based on the intermediate value theorem, and we can we can talk about that. One question here is about commercial aspect of this, uh, whether this is something which is commercially available or has been um, applied anywhere on any particular commercial controller. Um, so, uh, well, this is, so we have, uh, of course, work on this started with simulation and then with the experimental evaluation um, uh, in different stages. Uh, it's it's available as a research solution, uh, but not quite as a as a commercial solution. But that is something that we are hoping to uh, to be able to get to in future as well. Yes. Um. Thank you so much. I believe the next one would be: What's the effect of comms delay to the set point control on the performance of space? Uh, very good question. So. Uh, Space actually needs to be attached to, when I say attached means physically closed, uh, located close to the inverter itself. So in that case, essentially the delays, there will be no communications delay. Your delays are going to be the standard delays that your PI controller needs to also deal with. Uh, essentially, of course, the speed of light and of course the um, um, just the length of wires. So those those delays are going to be uh, quite a small, uh, just like again your primary control. Uh, but we are working on a coordinated version of a space. Which so what I talked about today has one space controller for each of our inverters. Uh, the coordinated space would say, okay, well, if I have multiple of inverters in the system, maybe I can get a better response if um, uh, all of them had these space controllers or space kind of add-on controllers. At the same time, those space units would be uh, talking to each other, would be coordinating with each other. That is actually something we are working on uh, with the communication um, kind of folks at uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, and the underlying kind of uh, technology there is the 5G technology, uh, something that would be uh, kind of suitable for this application. Uh, in that case, the, uh, the delays uh, can be a bit more kind of um, uh, something that actually needs to be looked at more carefully. As 5G, typically the latency is in the order of one millisecond. Uh, but of course, in that case, we wouldn't be using that coordination for uh, that coordinated space for primary control applications as well. Okay, thank you so much. So um, quickly about presentation slides, uh, the recordings will be available. Uh, we will uh, upload the recordings. And if Ali is happy for us, we'll also upload the uh, slides next to the recording. So you can find the recording and the slides on our website where we have um, advertised this talk um, uh, in particular on Monash Energy Institute website. Um, <clears throat> we've got another question here. Uh, can you compare space with classical controlling methods like hysteresis bank bank controlling methods? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, 
So, so one of the like differences between the space and hysteresis big bang control is uh, space uh, does not replace the original control that you have in the system. So, uh, so essentially for space, you do have your original PI controller, original whatever type of control you have, and space uh, essentially improves its performance. If there are certain cases that if I was given a system, if I actually had the capability to redesign the control for that particular, for example, inverter, then I would choose maybe hysteresis, I would choose maybe uh, PI, maybe some elaborate control methods. But again, the point of space is it's just a different uh, kind of solution that you already have your inverter, you already have your primary controller and that primary controller with the inverter, that system just does not meet your performance requirements. So how do I do in that case? So it's kind of a different uh, kind of a mentality, different type of design. Uh, because again, if I, if I could change my prime, primary controller, then uh, uh, I mean, I probably would simply redesign that controller and get something that I wanted better. Thank you so much. So uh, we've got one last question here, which I'm not sure it is easy to answer. Uh, inverters come in many shades of gray. Newer ones partially solve some of the problems you highlighted, uh, for example, overshoot. How will the second loop perform of if, uh, if it is already partially implemented? Um, uh, I guess I'm not understanding the question. How would the second loop perform if it's already- Yeah, the, the loop that you've got for set point modulation, oh. if something similar to that is already implemented in your uh, hmm. in your inverter, so what would be the impact or some sort of, in, would you have some sort of interaction between your method and something which is already implemented in, a, in an inverter that you don't have access to and you don't know whether it's been implemented or not? Yes. Uh, uh, very interesting question, and uh, uh, also different spellings of gray, American, and uh, and uh, Australian. Uh, so uh, that's a very good question, and one thing uh, that I can say is it would depend on uh, really the time frame that these different loops would operate on. So for example, that second loop, if it's uh, uh, already kind of partially implemented, if it's operating at the same time frame that the space operates, then it could kind of um, lead to some sort of uh, essentially interference. Uh, for us right now, uh, the PI controller, the original controller or the primary controller and the space, they actually operate on the same time scale. Um, but they both are much faster than the secondary control. Uh, this second uh, loop uh, that's being mentioned here, um, I, I think we it really would depend on the particular uh, kind of uh, functionalities that are implemented there uh, to be able to uh, to study and essentially address this uh, uh, this question. So I think that concludes our uh, Q and A session. Um, and the presentation. So as I said, the presentation and the slides, the recordings and the slides will be made available on our website, on Monash Energy Institute website, where we advertised uh, the webinar. Hopefully in the next couple of days uh, or maybe early next week, it will be available there. Thank you so much for attending uh, this webinar and thank you so much, Ali, for this very interesting presentation and very interesting concept. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yes, no worries. Thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the day.